42nd season for the Pittsburgh Baseball Club came to a conclusion yesterday at PNC Park, and it was, I'll say it out loud, a season of real progress. Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is the first off-season episode of Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into football and or hockey, I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins in the same place that you found this. And yes, this show does go on all year long. That's kind of one of the things about all three of the Daily Shots. They never stop. Pirates 3, Marlins 0 was the final score of the final game. Andre Jackson with four clean innings. Dowry Moretta striking out the side. David Bednar finishing up with his 39th save of an outstanding season. Connor Joe with a couple of hits. A good way to go out. A nice way to go out on Fan Appreciation Day. And all else that the final game of the summer always entails. And yes, I am here to say even though it should be really obvious that going 76 and 86 is a market improvement over 62 wins last year, 61 the year before, from the most macro perspective possible and measuring everything by the simple number under that really important column in the standings marked W, This is 14 games. It's 14 W's. Now, you can say, all right, well, if it wasn't for April, then this wouldn't have been whatever. And I've done that to an extent. I remain to this day exasperated that nothing was done to pounce on that April start. Maybe only because it feels like it just can continued to show that this front office can't be motivated, that it can't be moved to action unless it follows some sort of prescribed script. And that, for me, was a big, big put off. And to an extent, it still is. However, however, the script was there to be rewritten. And this team did a whole bunch of that over the final two and a half months. They really did. If you go after the All-Star break, the Pirates lost their first five right out of the gate. Remember that? Started off with that sweep at home by the Giants. And then they were an above 500 team. They were a team that competed at what would be projected over a full season about an 85-win pace. 85 wins, if you take a look at the Major League Baseball standings, you'll see that the last two teams in the National League to qualify were the Marlins, these Marlins, and the Diamondbacks, each with 84 wins. 84, that's it. The Cubs, rest their souls, were there at 83, just missing out. The Reds pretty much came out of nowhere, I think, for a lot of people. And the Padres, with their zillion-dollar payroll that they're now slashing, had 82 wins each. They were two games out from making the playoffs. That's a pretty tight pack. And oh, by the way, the Giants were five wins out, and the Pirates were next at eight wins out. Eight wins. Eight games back of being a wildcard team this year. So the the fun starts now, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to seeing what's left, what holes are there to fill, what positions can be legitimate upgrades without throwing off some sort of developmental path for someone or throwing Henry Davis out from behind the plate, where Ben Sherrington said yesterday, by the way, that Davis is going to come to spring training, ready to compete for a catching job. Okay, so that in turn would leave right field open to... Exactly. 
you're not just going to hand it over to Josh Palacios. You're going to go hit the open market. You're going to do the same thing. You have to for first base. You're going to do the same thing. You have to for the rotation. At least two significant starters, as I see it, two of them for that rotation. That's four players who are going to come at considerable expense. But guess what? In theory, they've got it to spend. They really do. I can look at the amount of money that they spent, actually paid out this year, and it comes close to $90 million when you get down to oh taxes, minor leagues, benefits, all these other things that get counted into what's called a competitive balance tax payroll, the way it's computed for the purpose of the luxury tax. But probably the more telling way to go about it is to say, all right, where are they if they just sign all of their current guys, their current players in-house? They're not going to lose any of these people, at least not anybody that they wouldn't want to. And then say, all right, now what's left? What's left and how much do we have to spend? I am of the view that Bob Nutting and Travis Williams should be authorizing a payroll of $100 million for 2024. That'll show me that they're interested and way more important than anything that they show me. That'll allow Charrington to go get his guys, to go after if these are his four objectives. He's not going to lay that card out to go get them, to go get them. That doesn't mean you have to go after the very highest price guys because you're going to get outbid for those. It doesn't mean you go chasing Shohei Otani or whatever. It, it could mean it could mean going in, uh, in pursuit of these Japanese. There's two Japanese free agent pitchers who are available from over there. It could mean making trades with teams that will be heading back into the direction where the Pirates were four years ago, that it's just going to say, look, we've had enough. We're selling off. I mentioned San Diego doing that, right? Okay, go get Joe Musgrove. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. That's what I'm talking about here. There's all kinds of different ways to execute this. Man, would it be cool to have Joe back though, right? When we come back, J1Q. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern. That's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Your front door, your car, your bike, your computer, your gun. Safety is a habit. Every day you lock and secure your home and everything you want to keep safe. Gun safety and responsible storage are no different and the best way to help prevent accidents, misuse, and theft. If you have a firearm, own it, respect it, and secure it. Visit ProjectChildSafe.org. Brought to you by the National Shooting Sports Foundation and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Today's J1Q comes from Mike, who says, Back in Bradenton, DK, you selected G1 Bay as your pick to click for a breakout in 2023. The players you interviewed picked Colin Holderman. How would you evaluate those picks now, and who would be your early favorite for 2024? Going back to this exercise, which is something that I do every year in spring training, for those of you who might be new to this show. I'll ask as many players as I can, including minor league guys, some of whom really don't have a realistic shot at making the main roster, who's going to be the breakout player in Pittsburgh for the coming season. And for those of you who've been following my work, whether it's spoken or written over the years, you might know that the players do really, really well on this. Like it was Jack Sawinski the year before with Brian Reynolds having told me when casting his vote 
that Jack reminded him of a young Josh Hamilton. I don't know that we're going to go that far with how Jack succeeded, but Jack has hit a lot of home runs in the bigs already. A lot. So this past season was a little bit tougher this this past spring because you didn't have uh, somebody who was going to be an immediate and awesome impact, but I will give the players a lot of credit for hitting on Holderman the way they did. Holderman did have a tough stretch, which might or might not have been influenced by a nagging injury that eventually got him shut down. And once he came back from the injury, he was fantastic again. That's awesome to have two closer capable guys, one of them being a really, really great closer already in David Bednar. That's a blessing. That's a wonderful thing for a team uh, that's going to fancy itself as a contender next year. You can't just fancy your way into it. You got to have the players, right? Holderman's one of those. Holderman's going to be the eighth inning guy. For this team next year, you don't have to wonder or worry about innings eight or nine. That chops down, to some extent, the number of innings that you need to fill as a management to seven. And the same thing goes for on-field managing. Uh, Great pick by the players. There were other guys that were mentioned, though, in there somewhat parenthetically, and they came from the players. The one that jumps out at me, Mike, more than anything else, and you might remember this, was Sawinski going to bat hard for Jared Triolo. And he was the only one who did. He said, you watch, that guy is going to come up and show everybody. I'm way more impressed with Jack hitting on Triolo than I am on anybody picking Holderman or me picking Bay. Uh, But I'm not exactly ashamed of the Bay pick. I mean... He was in the majors all year, you know, did some good things, showed some skills, also showed some shortcomings, particularly in his play at second base, and didn't show any, really, of that power that flashed early on in in the season. Again, I'm not sure what that was all about, but he didn't. Still, I mean... uh, You know, he could have been buried in the minors all year and you could have had a really good laugh at my expense. He was up. He was up. As for next year, oh, dude, we've got a whole off season of these shows to do. Let's save it for another time. All right. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. And we will, in fact, do another one tomorrow. Tomorrow.